Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Squadron, President of Our Energy Policy, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on a critical area um, that I think probably has received less attention than it should because of its importance in playing a significant role in the energy transition. And that topic is renewable natural gas. We have a superb panel to discuss this issue. Uh, we want to express our thanks to all of our partners and supporters of our energy policy that make this possible to bring this to you. Uh, and in particular, um, we want to express our um, appreciation to our co-host today, Brookhaven National Laboratory, as well as to our recently added partner, Clean Energy Fuels, um, which will be represented on the panel by Andrew Littlefair. So um, without any further ado, we are extremely fortunate today to have introductory remarks by Senator Tom Tillis, Republican from North Carolina, elected first in 2014, now serving his second term in the Senate, one of the leaders on issues involving agriculture and energy. And Senator Tillis will sort of set the foundation and then we will dive into the panel discussion. So first some words from Senator Tillis. Hi, I'm Tom Tillis, Senator from the great state of North Carolina. Thanks to OEP for inviting me to discuss RNG and transportation today. I believe RNG plays an important role in the future of domestic energy production and Congress should be doing everything we can to support its development. The United States simply extracts energy in a cleaner capacity than any other nation on earth. And pushing policies that encourage importing more energy is backwards looking. Additionally, we need to support investment into technologies that will allow us to use RNG in the transportation sector. RNG can become a viable alternative to using gasoline, particularly in heavy duty vehicles. I will continue to support policies that encourage expanded RNG development and technologies to take the next step in a wider usage of RNG. I look forward to working together with you on this important issue. Thank you. So thanks to Senator Tillis for laying that foundation for this discussion. I'm now going to welcome our panel. One thing I would say to all of our audience, the last part of the hour, we will be taking questions from you. So use the icon to type in your questions and we will get to as many as we possibly can before the end of the hour. Um, I'd also encourage you to look at our energy library, which is on the OEP website that contains additional materials um, on this topic, as well as on all topics related to energy policy as you all are working on them. Um, but particularly we have um, highlighted ones on this important area for today. So we're going to turn it over to the panel. We are very fortunate to have as our moderator today, uh, David Manning, who has a long and very distinguished career in the energy field. He's currently the director of stakeholder relations for the Brookhaven National Laboratories. He has previously been a deputy minister of energy for Alberta, Canada, was the vice president of corporate and public affairs for National Grid. I could go on and on, but I'm sure you all want to get to our topic of the day. So, uh, David, please take it away. Bill, thank you very much. This, uh, this is very timely. Uh, we're certainly all very much aware of the current climate events. I just want to quote one of our BNL scientists. Alison McConsky has been heading up climate uh, research here. For some time and she pointed out that she's been working on climate since she was a grad student she never expected to experience it she's only mid-career and it's here and that had a lot of impact on me and and certainly the last month or two has been so dramatic uh we have a tremendous panel uh, as i said this is very timely to talk about carbon reduction um I, we have andrew littlefair Andrew, just say hi. Uh, Andrew and I go back. Uh, he was one of the originators of the whole movement for alternative uh, fuels. Uh, my boss, Bob Cattell, his license plates at NGV1, right. and we were partnering with Andrew and his partner, Pickens. So they have been converting vehicles from, from the very get-go. So he's an originator of this, and I'm very thrilled that he's here with us. Um, David Cox, is on the legal and policy side. You can certainly Google him, um, but he's bringing that legal expertise and policy expertise to see this, uh, see this advance. And, and I'm also very thrilled that Marianne Mintz is here from Argonne. 
um, a tremendous national laboratory. And she, of course, is the principal energy analyst at Argonne and has published over 120 papers. So it's a terrific panel. I'm going to move fairly quickly here because, and the Department of Energy has, the U.S. Department of Energy has been leading this initiative to decarbonize. And just in May, issued their seventh Earthshot, uh, which, of course, is titled Clean Fuels and Products. So, panel, by way of opening, um, perhaps you could touch on uh, the principal sources and uh, and applications of RNG. Let's let's start off with just sort of the primer. I know it's a sophisticated audience, but let's right. talk a little bit about source and application. Oh, uh, thank you, David, and and others on the panel are expert in this too. So if when if I botch it, somebody help out. But you know, renewable natural gas is, in my view, is uh, why I feel so good about where we are today is because we're really you know, we're capturing methane that otherwise is going to the atmosphere. And so the principal uh, sources today are landfills, wastewater, uh, manure, uh, organics. And the potential of all of those sources could be very great. You know, we're in early days, but uh, we see significant uh, uh, landfill uh, capturing of, uh, of, of methane from landfills, RNG, uh, dairies. That's the one that I'm most heavily involved in, David, which is is literally capturing manure, putting it in a digester, uh, doing a little bit of cleanup and putting it in the pipeline. Uh, but that that's sort of the, the basis of it. And, you know, it, it really is a, a powerful because it's a very low carbon fuel when you begin to compare it to the other uh, the other sources. And so there's projects, there's billions of dollars of projects that are underway that have already been brought. And, and finally, those that RNG is finding its way into make electricity, or it's finding its way into uh, transportation. And I, as you well know, I'm heavily focused on the transportation side. Others, I think, are more expert on maybe what's happening to decarbonize uh, the electric grid. Great. Thank you. Marianne, did you want to jump in and talk also about other potential markets and... and uh, uh... Sure. Uh, the the markets are extremely diverse, as Andrew indicated. Um, the fuel can go into transportation, which is basically what my focus has been as well. Uh, but it can also generate; it could be used to generate electricity. And increasingly, uh, in some of the the latest uh, legislation that's come out, it's being looked at as a feedstock for other alternative fuels, particularly um, sustainable aviation fuel and some other. Um, biologic fuels. So uh, it's it can go in many different directions. Uh, because of all of the the uh, incentives that have been pl in place from the renewable fuel standard and, and other other uh, legislation on the state level, for example, uh, it has primarily been going into transportation in the last few years. It's been heavily incentivized for transportation, but it has multiple, multiple applications. And David, I'm going to give you a shot as well. Is there any we missed? No, listen, I think Andrew nailed it. Um, we're dealing with waste feedstock, right? This is the leftovers of the leftovers. And, and those are sources that you know, uh, are readily available and produced in every community. Uh, in terms of, of you know, Mary Ann's answer, again, she, she nailed it again. RNG is a, a Swiss army knife for the energy transition. I mean, we can, we're fungible with geologic natural gas and can serve as feedstock to all these other sources. So um, I think it's a great, great way to Kind of set the stage for what we're going to be talking about today. It's it's an exciting fuel, and uh, yeah, I think there's some some good things to talk about here. You know, David, if I just may, uh, maybe I'm just get, get warmed up, but you know, we like to suggest that RNG is is the feedstock is the is the lowest greenest feedstock that could be used for hydrogen or electricity or just directly put it into a vehicle. So, I mean, I think you you have a hard time. You know, when people talk about the future, the hydrogen fuel cell future, and they start talking about wind and solar and all that, boy, you know, you know, RNG is a lower carbon fuel. So imagine you could use the nation's pipeline grid to 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 capture methane at a dairy or at a at a wastewater treatment and put it into the grid and pull it out at a station. I think the future will be you'll pull it out, you'll reform it at a station and put it into the vehicle, no matter what kind of, no matter if it's a uh, you know directly into a vehicle or if it happens to end up being a, a hydrogen fuel cell. So I think RNG is is really a beautiful fuel that all pathways will end up uh, wanting RNG. 
Okay, so then that's the perfect segue into um, its relationship to natural gas and its potential to displace natural gas. Um, and and what is needed? I mean, that this this is gonna, David is going to bring in policy. It's going to bring state, but but. What is the potential to displace natural gas, and what is the time frame? What are the economics? I think the first thing we need to just kind of set out is that you know, RNG is not a fossil fuel, right? But it is right. methane based. Renewable natural gas is, is biomethane by and large, and and therefore it is fully interchangeable with natural gas in any natural gas application or infrastructure. Right, and so. You know, when you ask about RNG replacing natural gas, it's it's a one for one drop in fuel, and it it is fully uh, fully fungible from that standpoint. But if you ask, you know, will RNG replace natural gas? I think the answer is no. It's certainly not at today's levels of natural gas demand. Um, but that's not really the goal, right? RNG is a, a fuel in and of itself uh, that is very compatible with natural gas. And, and that's one of the reasons why you know, we like it so much. Um, when you look at projections out, you know, what percentage of the uh, kind of total portfolio of gas will RNG make up? It, a lot of it depends on your assumptions on how much natural gas demand there's going to be in the future. And that's really wide ranging right now. You know, David, I, I look at it, if I can just kind of throw it out for the people that are listening. So I think about it displacing not natural gas, as David, I think, accurately tries to help us think about it. I, I think about it display because remember, I'm in the transportation side of this business. I think about it as dis displacing diesel. Mm -hmm. All right. And so when I look at my markets, which are, you know, refuse, heavy duty, heavy duty transportation, transit, refuse, airport for freighting and and uh and trucking uh that's a 40 roughly a 40 billion gallon annual market okay and then you know as david says you could and marianne will tell us there, there's a bunch of studies about you know how how much rng might be available and i i kind of discount it and this and that and i kind of you know, I'm an old political science major. So I kind of wrap it up and say, well, let's listen over 10 years. You know, if you ended up with 10 billion gallons of RNG or something in that neighborhood, you'd be doing really well. And so you think, well, is that just a niche fuel? And the way I think about it is, well, no, because 10 billion gallons of the 40 billion gallons. But in terms of carbon intensity, we're dramatically lower, four or five times lower. And so it's as if you displaced half of the diesel fuel operating in North America's transportation. I mean, that's the way I think about it. So it's very impactful. Now, if you use my same 10, 10 to 15 billion gallons, Marianne will correct me on what she sees in the future, but in that in that area, well, how much natural gas is that? Well, that's a, equivalent to two TCF, two trillion cubic feet. So that's a lot of gas. That's only 10% of the natural gas that we're using almost uh, now uh, in the United States, but it's it's dramatically lower carbon. So it, it, that's as if you displace six or eight trillion cubic feet in natural gas, which would be a hell of a, an achievement. So anyway, I probably confused everybody on all that, but that's kind of the way I think about it is displacing diesel. Oh, but you have clearly tossed the ball to Marianne. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I, I have to apologize because you talk in TCFs. I think of quadrillion BTUs. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so um, I, you're right, absolutely right, uh, Andrew, that there, there are a wealth of projections and they have different assumptions and you have to kind of peel off the onion to figure out exactly what, what are they saying. Um, I look primarily at and a, a renewable natural gas from anaerobic digestion. There are other technologies that can generate uh, renewable natural gas. And so I'm just taking, taking at the, the one that we have here and now from digesting animal manures or uh, from wastewater treatment plants or what comes out of a landfill in the form of landfill gas. Um, and that could displace, I agree with you, about 10% of um, natural gas use in the, use in the country, um, assuming that's fairly stable. Uh, but even more importantly, if it were all to go into transportation, it could pretty much displace all of the class seven and eight heavy duty trucks that that operate in, in, in inner city trucking. It could pretty much fuel all of that. But I'm not saying that it would because there are other fuels out there. There's renewable diesel. Uh, there's a lot of work going on from hydrogen fuel cells. 
I see it as a companion to all of those and as a way of getting to that long-term future where we are looking at renewable hydrogen. Um, and there are even technologies today that can use um, renewable natural gas in combination with hydrogen. Right. So, you know, all of those things are evolving at different rates and they're all coming, coming, coming. Uh, they're not here right now. And that's the big advantage of RNG. It's here right now. Right. And it's a drop in fuel, as, as David indicated. So, Marion, could you also address jet fuel? I mean, I, we, we know that there's six or seven different airlines that now they're all banding together to work on this. I, I have a vested interest. I have grandkids in the U.S., Canada, and Australia. So, mm -hmm. you know, as people push us to stop flying, we're not doing as much business flying, but personal flying is going to be in my life until I'm gone. So uh, can you talk a little bit about sustainable aviation fuel? Is that I don't work specifically on sustainable aviation fuel, but I, I do see a lot of interest there. Um, it, there are trials going on. Uh, there, you know, there've been a lot of uh, a lot of speculation and a lot in the news. I think that is a long-term option, but there, and that's that's part of this this whole point. R and G can go in many different directions. So depending upon what you assume for where it's going to go, then you come up with a different percent that it could displace. Uh, if you assume it's all going to go into electricity and it's going to decarbonize the grid, then there's nothing for sustainable aviation fuel. If you assume it, yeah, you know, it's all a question of you know where it's going to go. And at this point, it's it's too early days to say where it's going to go. No, I, that's a very good point. And and so of course now my next question is how to move it faster, and that brings up the renewable fuel standard. I mean, uh, can we address uh, that program, uh, state impacts? Let, let's talk about how we expand the use. I think we all concur that Andrew made the point that it's a real benefit and an advantage, and you made the point wherever it goes. So let's talk about how we're going to get there more quickly. So first, the renewable fuel standard uh, impact. Yeah, I can I can take this one. So baseline renewable fuel standard is it's the U.S. federal program that requires a certain percentage uh, of our gasoline and diesel portfolio to include certain percentages of, of four basic renewable fuels, right? So the RFS classifies renewable natural gas as cellulosic biofuel. So that is the most advanced, the highest value of those four renewable fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, renewable natural gas has been part of the program since 2014. It's been a huge driver for growth in transportation fuel. Um, and within you know the last month here, we got our latest rule from EPA uh, to the point where it's taking us over the next three years at a 25% annual rate of growth. So that's taking us in 2022 from 630 million gallons, uh, that's ethanol gallon equivalents um, in, in 2022 in terms of demand to 840 million, over 1 billion in 2024 and to 1.38 billion in 2025. That's so a huge driver of growth. Uh, historically, but also in the very immediate future. And that's the federal program. Anybody else want to speak to that? Well, no, I would just say that, you know, if, um, I think David did an excellent job on that. And then, of course, as, as a, uh, a piece of that, uh, we've seen uh, California exert its leadership on, and then they put in place, right? And I think most of your listeners will be familiar with the thing called the low carbon fuel standard. Now, to where the federal program really focuses on a renewable fuel, right? This then uh, rewards and creates a program for, and someone can describe better than I can probably, but for a, for carbon, right? Lower carbon fuels. And, you know, we've seen the, the RNG just be a, I mean, and, and the truth is the low carbon fuel standard in California has worked and it's worked very well. And RNG has been, uh, you know, and renewable diesels participated as well here recently, but 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 RNG has really led the way to be a very cost effective fuel. In fact, we have almost 200 fueling stations, David. So you wonder what I've been doing all these years since we first met 30 some odd years ago. Uh, we have 200 fueling stations just in California alone, and 100 percent of that fuel is renewable today. We sell close to 450 million gallons of uh, fuel or 400 million gallons in our network. And 83% of that is, is RNG. So we've shifted in a big way. And you know why? Because our customers that are faced with you know, lowering their carbon uh, footprint and, and have their own sustainability goals that they're having to begin to you know, do something about, 
in a, in a voluntary way is in many cases, uh, want RNG. So it, you know, we rarely have a conversation with one of our heavy duty fleets, such as Amazon or UPS, or where they say, Oh, forget that RNG, give me the fossil natural gas. So it's really worked. The low carbon fuel standard is kind of going through what David just described that just happened at the federal level. They're kind of uh, retooling for the next five years. And so it's, it's very, uh, I believe that you're going to see California drop the curve. That is encourage it even higher compliance. You know, right now they've tried to reduce carbon by 20% in the fuels. And I think there's likely to take to something closer to 35%. So you're, you know what, you're going to need all the RNG you can get. It'll flow to California. And finally on that, not to take up all the talk time, other states have adopted a low carbon fuel standard. So you've got Oregon and Washington and Canada as is just getting started. I think New York, we've been very close to pass it there. I'm sure New Jersey, Illinois, and others. So I think you'll see this continue because it's, as Marianne says, it's it's here today and it uses the existing pipeline system and it does provide lower uh, of super low carbon fuel. And, and so, Marianne, I'm going to come back to you. Is that California standard? Is that a model? And, and you know, Andrew just again tossed you the ball on state incentives. Uh, we obviously are sitting in New York. I think there's been some frustration with some players in New York that is still seen as some form of combustion. Although I'd, I'd rather you get into that. I'm going to step back. So, so can you? Well, I agree. About- Calif- yeah. California is an excellent model that they that standard has worked remarkably well in fact it's worked better than they expected which is why they're looking to tighten it as as andrew said Uh, i think that the specifics may change by state because states have different uh different economies california is a very big dairy state and so they gave uh, the dairy industry a long on-ramp to to tighten their emissions uh, Washington and Oregon, their standard is basically the same as the California standard. Uh, the other states that have been trying to adopt one is, as Andrew indicated, New York, Illinois, New Mexico is another one. Uh, they've gotten very close in New Mexico uh, twice. Uh, so yes, I see, I see that. It, they may look a little bit different because not all of those states are big dairy states. They, they may want to incentivize ethanol, for example, in some states. So it, it may look a little bit different. Uh, but the 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 mechanics uh, have worked remarkably well, and California is is tightening up some of the restrictions on out of state sources. I know they're looking at. It used to be if you could if you could if you could prove that your molecule could get to California, even though it was generated in another state, uh, you you could get that pathway approved by by California as. A legitimate pathway for RNG. Now they're saying that the pipeline actually has to go in the right direction, the flow. So they, they've changed that a little bit and they're, they're, they're looking at small changes. Um, so, you know, a lot of these things are going to change over time, but, but not in the direction to cut off the supply of RNG. It's still going to be incentivized. All right. But then that, then that does raise the question about partnerships, community engagement, advocacy. I mean, um, how do we move the ball? Now, Andrew, Andrew, you scared me a little bit if you said, well, you know, we're using everything we can make. I'm assuming that there is a significant opportunity for growth um, and that and that those kinds of community drivers will be helpful. So um, who wants to start there? And David, I mean, that's really your world on the policy side. Can we start with you and then go around? Sure. This is partnership, so- it's community engagement. It's what's going to drive this? Right. So, yeah, announcement, we'll, we'll roll this out tomorrow, but uh, the RNG industry just brought online its 300th RNG facility. That's where we're, we're at today. Very big milestone for us. Um, but to give you a sense of you know, what's, what's coming in the pipeline, there's another 178 projects today that are under construction. Shovels in the ground, you know, moving forward. Behind that, there's another 300 plus that have been announced that are you know, going through funding processes and, and whatnot. So we have this kind of pipeline of growth coming, right? So just last year, we had 17 states pass pro RNG legislation. Every state is talking about it. Every state is looking to figure out how can they advance it? How can they do their part? And it really varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction on what it takes. Um, 
the 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 LCFS kind of clean fuel standard we think is is an A plus policy. You know, another policy that we're seeing you know really drive RNG is a renewable gas standard, right? So that's a portfolio approach to the pipeline and having a certain percentage of the of the pipeline um, delivery to customers from utilities come from renewable natural gas. Uh, but then there's a lot of policies that need to happen on the on ancillary levels. It's it's granting permissions for certain things to happen. It's it's helping differentiate between renewable natural gas and a traditional natural gas and those types of things. So, um, you know, I I work at RNG Coalition. This is a, a a coalition of companies that have been advancing public policy, and you know, it's one of the reasons why we pl place such a heavy emphasis and and have hired such a a robust state policy team is because this is where the, the kind of battlefield is being laid out. It's where the rules of the game are being crafted. Um, and I will tell you that we're winning in that front. We're we are seeing great advancement that are in ab that is enabling um, development. And so I, I think you know that's from a policy standpoint what needs to take place. I will pause there. I'm happy to go into the kind of community engagement, but I want to you know, let uh, the Andrew opine here. Yeah, Matt. well, and, and I, and David, I want to hear that. And maybe before I go, David, how many members do you have in the RNG? I think that's, a, that'll be instructive. How many members do you have of your, of your group? So our coalition is the full value chain. It's, it's the yep. folks that touch the feedstock all the way to dispense the fuel, everything in between. So we're at um, right on 400. Yeah. Companies. So, so the point, uh, David, is, is is this is commercial. Okay. Yes, of course we have to avail ourselves to the credits, to the to the federal credits and the others. Otherwise, this is a uh, tougher. But uh, you know, my partners in this is uh, BP and Total Energies. All right, Shell's involved, Chevron's involved, and and there's there are dozens of developers. Of course, uh, our partners are fleets. Our partners are communities, dairy farmers, uh, the National Dairy Associations are all getting involved, and, and David's seeing that at the at the in the state level. So, you know, we're we're a little past, you know, that we're all having to do kumbaya and you know hope and pray in the community. I mean, we're we're trying to all, uh, you know, this is commercial. And there's lots of money going in. Our little company is, uh, uh, we've already committed and uh, we have eight, eight projects under construction, brought our first, uh, our, our first online uh, in February. We'll have seven more this year. We have eight more uh, in the final uh, permitting. So, you know, it's this kind of same pipeline that Davis talked about, but we have uh, fleets that want to have the offtakes. We're actually offtaking fuel today from uh, David from 65 different producers. So, I mean, a lot's happened. And of course, yes, there are community digesters in some rural areas. And so there's all sorts of flavors of how the communities and others are involved. But, but you know, there's real enterprise, real commercial, lots of billions of dollars at stake here that are wanting to get invested. So this is jobs and, and this is equipment. And so this is real. This isn't uh, kind of wannabe stuff. This is happening. Marianne, I'll come to you in just one second, but David stopped at the pump. He talked about production to dispense. What about the, the truck manufacturers? I mean, so many, so many of the gains have been heavy hauling transportation. Um, I mean, this is original equipment stuff now, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to convert your truck. You can buy th these. These Could you touch on that? that Listen, I mean, Cummins has a fantastic engine that's, that's meeting the highest you know, performance standards, you know, available um, in terms of, of air quality and, and the whole nine yards. So, you know, these trucks are on the road today. Uh, the fuel is is uh, in the fleets. And you know, Andrew mentioned some of their customers, right? Some big brand names that are using RNG to, to move their goods. And so, uh, no, you're right. It doesn't stop at the pump. And, and that's on the transportation side. I mean, even on the, the non-transportation side, we're seeing Fortune 500 companies, you know, all the way to the biggest brand names in the world, take on RNG for uh, kind of decarbonization, defossilization of their um, their thermal load in order to meet their ESG goals, to meet the commitments that they've made to governments or made to their shareholders, um, and that's you know really the the you know large growing part of this sector that is in development. We've had this transportation piece, and we have a, you know a great future ahead in transportation, but and you know, that part of it is what's what's coming along. So you're right, the consumers are a huge part of this. 
so so Marianne, but over to you. You may want to add something to the. To yes, the I would like to add a little bit to what David just said. Um, the the Cummins engine is 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 just a tremendous uh, development. It's it's commercially available now. Packard is offering it both in Peterbilt and and Kenworth lines, and it's lighter than the, the 12 liter engine that they've been offering for a number of years more and more powerful obviously so it's 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 really a big introduction to the market and it supports existing uh fleets that have already converted uh to natural gas and there's quite a bit of that as as andrew indicated uh, a lot of the uh i believe it's like over over half of all refuse trucks that have been sold in the last few years have been natural gas fuel cng or rng fueled and so then this new engine is particularly uh, useful in, in that application, as well as for long distance trucking. So uh, it, it provides a, a real benefit to, to fleets that have converted to natural gas. And in fact, I, I wanna make the point that a lot of fleets see their sustainability um, path as a mixture of fuels. They look at, Electric vehicles for short haul operations, pickup and delivery, uh, first and last mile, and then they look at a longer up, a longer range alternative for for intercity and and perhaps even regional trucking. And for that longer alternative, they're increasingly looking to RNG. And a good example uh, is Walmart. Uh, they they've been investing in a lot of long haul uh, tractors for for their for their longer routes. At the same time that they're buying electric vehicles for the shorter shorter routes. And the same strategy is true of uh, Amazon and a number of other big names in the industry. So it's it's a mix of fuels depending upon the duty cycle. Some, some duty cycles require the longer range that RNG or can provide. Uh, they can go 700 miles or even or even longer depending upon additional tanks that, that they can be outfitted with. So they, they really fill a, um, a niche that Electric vehicles are unlikely to fill. And Marianne, I need to take you out on the road with me because you have it just right. But uh, the the Cummins engine that Marianne's talking about, because I didn't hear this, maybe I just didn't hear it, but it's, it's the 15 liter. And the reason yes. this is yes. so important is uh, is because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, but 80% of the diesel over the road trucks on them uh, are, are 15 liter. Mm -hmm. Right. So we haven't had the 15 liter. So so that's what's very exciting this summer is Walmart, UPS, Amazon, Warner, J.B. Hunt, all of these world class large at night swift. They're all in the kind of introduction this summer of this new 15 liter. And so I happen to think this is a real crystallizing event because finally you'll have the right product for over the road trucking and just night swift is an example. Uh, they have 26,000 trucks. They have to buy 5,500 trucks just to replace every year. So you finally have arrived at some fleets that can really use a lot of fuel and put a lot of vehicles on the road. So we're very excited about this new Cummins 15 liter. And I think Cummins is too. So and I as I recall, it's manufactured in New York. This is yeah, yeah. It's, I think Jamestown, a, Jamestown, New York uh, plant, I think is uh, yeah, think. exactly. So my my point there is what we're not taking shots at batteries, but it is a complete, this is a very domestic story, right? You know, throughout the entire manufacturing element. Now, what about you know, David, you mentioned just thermal load. Uh Marianne, is there is there a chemical is there a chemical application here as well, or is it primarily just, is it just thermal? Is it just it just backing out carbon fuels to for heat processing, that kind of thing? Is that the major use? I'm just getting away from transportation fuels for a moment. Is there another area of growth? Well, we mentioned SAF before, but that's also transportation. Um, there, there are other applications, particularly, particularly power generation is, is a, a key one, or, or just adding it to the natural gas network for, for like you said, for thermal applications. I, I can't really speak to, to industries that use it uh, directly for thermal applications. I know there are some. Uh, there are some dedicated pipelines uh, from uh, particular landfills or whatever that, that, that support thermal applications, but that's, that's not something that I, I've really been following. I, I mean, I can give you an example that was just in the headlines, right? So AstraZeneca signed up for 
you know, with Vanguard Renewables to supply all of their U.S. plants with renewable natural gas, right? So they're going 100% renewable. Um, I think that's that's a great example, and it's the very type of thing that can happen. You asked about chemicals. When, when we're talking about the applications for renewable natural gas, we're talking fuel, heat, power, and products, right? Natural gas is an input within so many of just the consumer goods that we use today, and RNG being fully fungible with natural gas has that application. So when companies are looking to make their products more sustainable, not just their processes more sustainable, RNG is a, a great um, you know, fit. So who's doing the work on improving the efficiency? Is there, is there an enhancement program? Is there science and technology going into increasing the environmental benefits? Absolutely. So uh, at RNG Coalition, you know, we have uh, you know, a, a series called RNG Works. This is kind of our, our process of promoting best practices, looking for those inefficiencies, bringing all of the de developers and technology providers together, uh, kind of push the envelope on what is what is possible with our efficiencies. I think some of the big things that we're looking at right now are you know the, the power inputs when we're doing the cleaning and conditioning of biogas to biomethane, uh, those power inputs really matter. Right, um, and it's looking at at things like, um, you know, what what can we do to co-locate uh, um, RNG facilities with other technologies that are kind of part of these new new energy technologies, right? So pairing carbon capture with renewable natural gas, which became a lot more viable with the IRA changes, right? So I mean, there's there's so many of those types of directions that we can go. And, and it starts with recognizing that RNG is a piece and a critical piece of the puzzle. It's not the silver bullet, but it is it is such an important piece of this. And so you have to look at and what are those other pieces around it that fit together for the bigger picture? That's a really good point. And, and you know, Andrew, you, you may want to pick up on this. Just what are the misconceptions? Uh, is, is there are there anything anything that we should be concerned about or I, and, and I'm going to jump also to hydrogen because hydrogen is getting so much attention at the moment. And, and uh, I, maybe we can just talk about that. Are there misconceptions about RNG that need to be dealt with? And, and why are we not talking more about it when you hear so many conversations on hydrogen with some of the challenges that are still out there? As you pointed out, you know, half an hour ago, RNG is here now. Well, and I and I guess, and not to get too controversial, I think it's often many many of our uh, folks in the environmental community have really focused on the battery. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's all about the battery, and and it kind of sucks out a lot of the oxygen uh, about. And so when you read a lot of headlines in the papers, we're always focused on the battery and light duty batteries and heavy duty, uh, you know, uh, it's a little different. And I think the market, uh, certainly our heavy duty fleet customers understand those are different. Um, we, we don't sit around and talk with our big heavy duty over the road customers and they understand the difficulties and the challenges with battery electric. Okay. So I think that's part of it, uh, David, is uh, meanwhile, as, as David said, there's, there are, there, there are hundreds of projects happening and, and we just kind of have to go about our way. What I tell my sales force and, and our people that work with fleeces, just keep plowing here because uh, you're going to have a recognition that maybe a uh, heavy duty battery is, is not is not as ready as people would like to think, and and we are and will be, and so that that so that's maybe one misconception is we just don't get the we don't get the you know the the love, uh, but but we probably pound for pound we're sure doing more business than than some of the others. The other misconception is that well this is just happening in California, right? And and that's not so, right? We're actually disseminating RNG to fleet customers now in forty states. So this is happening all over. Um, I would so just maybe add those, there maybe those are the two. is actually the second of the states in terms of volume, and Texas okay. has more. Okay, so. So there, 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 there you go. And then on hydrogen, look, I happen to think that RNG will end up being a beautiful solution for hydrogen. But, but I also, uh, maybe it's because I've just been at it so long, I happen to think that hydrogen and fuel cell technologies and heavy duties a little further out than some people 
would like to think. And I, I do believe that it'll be a beautiful way to move a very low carbon fuel to a location and reform it and put it in a vehicle. I think that may end up being the way this goes eventually, but we're not quite, you know, that's not quite happening yet, but I think that'll be the natural evolution because I happen to be a huge believer in the RNG. The, this idea that hydrogen David, uh, and, and I'm not knocking it. I just think it's a little further out. I mean, look, we just finished our second hydrogen fuel station for a transit customer. The station's 10x of what a natural gas fueling station would have been. The vehicles are three and a half X. The fuel, I'm, I'm selling some of the cheapest hydrogen around is $18 a gallon. Okay, so we got a ways to go on that. And if you weren't a federally funded transit property, you know, that's just, it's, it's tough, but I think eventually you'll see RNG end up being an application for the feedstock uh, as this goes forward. But I think it's further out than people think. I, I can agree, Andrew. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of, a um, lot of anticipation for hydrogen. There's a lot, there's a lot of, you know, ex ex thinking that it's here and now, and it's not, uh, you can't go out and buy a hydrogen fuel cell class A truck, if you live in Illinois, <laughs> where I am. Right. Um, and, but, but people go to events and they, they hear about it and they get all excited. And then they go, they, they, they talk to their dealer and it's like, no, you know, maybe if you're in California and you're operating a fleet in a port, you might be able to get, become part of a pilot demonstration. Um, but then it's a question of whether you can get the fuel. And there was just an incident last week at a transit property in Bakersfield right. where they had a fire and it, it's not clear exactly the cause of the fire, but, but the point was it destroyed one bus and there were 10 others that were not, not damaged in any way, but they couldn't fuel them because yeah. that was the, the yeah. station was the source of the fuel. So the infrastructure is a particular problem with hydrogen. Uh, it's difficult with, with electric vehicles. It's even more difficult with hydrogen. As Andrew indicated, 10 times the cost for the station um, and they're really only going in in California and maybe in Texas. So other parts of the country, it's it's going to take a long time. Yeah, I just wanted... I would like to add, though, on the kind of flip side of this is that when you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, it was a big uh, supporter for RNG in there. We, we got some big wins. Part of that, too, though, there was, you know, a section in there for, for hydrogen. Right. Yes. There's the, the 45 V. And RNG is a kind of qualified feedstock for hydrogen under that 45V. And they took an emissions per kilogram of hydrogen produced approach to that. They said, you know, we don't know what color is, is what color. We're not going to try to say green, blue, purple, or, or whatever hydrogen. We're going to say, prove it on the emission side. And when you use RNG as a feedstock to create hydrogen, you are at the highest tier, the most value from those tax credits. Yeah. So to the extent you believe in hydrogen, you believe that is, you know, coming in our immediate future, you look at the IRA, RNG has a big part in that hydrogen story. And, and very quickly, because we're going to turn to Bill Squadron in about five seconds here, uh, Staten Island has been producing renewable natural gas right into the grid for over three decades, Andrew knows as well, but when it was introduced, uh, Ed Koch was there and they connected a propane tank to a barbecue secretly and told him he was making hot dogs based on the fresh kills emissions. Yep. And, and I think the press were pretty horrified, but it's been working beautifully for 40, 40 years, Andrew, something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. into the system. So, yeah. Bill, are you, are, you, are you with us? I think it's time to turn to questions from the floor. Yeah, well, it's actually Jordan Crow here. I appreciate the panel Jordan, discussion. It's gone really smoothly. I'll jump right into things here with questions from the audience. If RNG is a, quote, drop-in fuel, are gas and electric utilities doing more with RNG? Short answer is yes. Um, you know, we have one of the top 40 gas utilities in the country as part of our RNG coalition. Right? Every one of them is working on it in some way, shape, or form. Some of them are further along than others because they started earlier. Right. Uh, but every one of them sees RNG as kind of part of um, that fuel mix within the gas system that they're going to be working with. Yep. I, I appreciate that. Moving on to the next here. Can the panel address how switching to RNG has an effect on food cost? Well, I'll tell you, we're dealing with food waste, right? right? So this is the apple core. This isn't the apple. 
You know, we're 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 not we're not going out and growing purpose grown crops for purposes of creating RNG. And so that's that's the distinction. Um, and so I don't think you're going to find a, a, a correlative effect uh, on RNG versus food costs the same way you might with uh, ethanol. You know, one of the one of the things that we you know occasionally will have uh, very so in in the way our business works, right? Our our haulers are the trucking companies. They're hauling for maybe Procter and Gamble, right? Who doesn't have trucks or Unilever? Unilever has done a big study. Now somebody may have read it better than I have. Unilever did a real you know uh, international company, very very keen on well, just what do these different alternative fields? How do they impact society? How do they impact? Uh, food cost and food. Uh, Unilever did a study and RNG ended up being their top choice in terms, certainly as, as, as in terms of it's the least amount of impact on, on uh, food and other things. Yeah, I can add also uh, the, at the pump price for RNG versus fossil CNG, there's really no difference. Right, right. All right, I appreciate that. Uh, so given the comments earlier around the use of RNG feedstock into clean hydrogen production, do you all have any concerns around the inclusion of market-based mechanisms and negative carbon intensity scores that are key to blue hydrogen production pathways? Can you repeat that? Sure. That's going to have to be one. David or Marianne are going to have to handle that one. <laughs> <laughs> One more well, time. Me, yeah, actually, I think I can. I think I can. I see where they're going with that. So, I talked about the IRA, right? They're, they're taking a performance-based approach to that. And you know, when when we look at you know, what are the the measurement tools we look at for life cycle greenhouse gas emissions, kind of the the gold standard is Argonne National Labs GREEP model, right? And so, to the extent in the in the processes that that the Greek model or something substantially similar is what is uh, adopted. I think we've proven that we are the top performer, you know, if, if not in definitely that top tier, right? And so, you know, is there is there an opportunity for um, you know, policymakers to still screw that sort of thing up? Sure. You know, these are these are formulas. I think though that are based in science. They are they're complex, um, but it is it's certainly important on how we measure and what kind of transparency we provide to that performance. And I would also I also mentioned that a key aspect of calculating the carbon intensity of any pathway is what the reference case was what was going on before this particular rng or whatever yeah. uh, was 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 put on the market and actually developed in a particular project so that is very important to define that accurately and it will be project project specific so um a lot of these things are Kind of squishy. It's kind of hard to talk about them in 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 overall global terms because it is very very project specific. Uh, but yes, the Greek model does do that, and in California they use a version of the model that's been adapted to California, and there are I think Canada has one similar, and you know it's it's they're different versions, but they they all basically use the same type of approach. So um, you know there are other suggestions for other ways to calculate these things. Um, I'm I'm not going to go there, but uh, there, there are different ways to calculate uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and it, it could change in the future, I suppose. It, as nice as it would be to be able to say, all right, there's one number for RNG in terms of carbon intensity, it's actually much better for it to be project specific when you think about the way the market works. Because mm -hmm. if Andrew goes out to his facility and makes an improvement, he can see a direct benefit to the carbon intensity, right? So it incentivizes projects to continue to get cleaner and cleaner. And it gives um, folks that do invest in better environmental performance, you know, a financial incentive to do it. All right, thanks for your feedback on that. Next question is, what is your view of using RNG for building heat? In Massachusetts, there is a debate about using RNG for this. 
Well, let, let me let me uh, be controversial uh, because I'm 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 uh, I'm focused on transportation. I happen to think that when you're looking to to decarbonize heavy duty trucking, you're now tackling one of the toughest things to decarbonize. I mean, look, you're trying to displace diesel, right? And so I am a believer. I'm, I'm not saying it's a lot of my friends are are moving it into into uh, into uh, power gen and, and into uh, into the uh, natural gas system. And it, of course, it could do a good job at uh, heating a, a building in Boston. Uh, I happen to think that's like you. You know, I had the the old uh, David. You'll remember the old. Uh, Secretary of Energy years ago, he said using natural gas in, in those days, he said using natural gas to make electricity is like washing your car with champagne. And so I, I'm a believer of that. I think the highest and best use of RNG is to decarbonize heavy duty trucking uh, and, and not putting it into warm up a building. But um, I mean, that's kind of my view is I think let's let's put it to a place where you could do the best decarbonization. But uh, I'm sure Mary and David have a little bit different take on exactly that. My understanding is that the most efficient technology for warming up a building um, is heat pumps. So I don't I, I, that's, I don't. that's certainly part of the discussion they're having in Massachusetts right now. Right. I mean, that's I, but I think to say RNG is an option and. A, you know, a productive way to heat a building doesn't mean to say that heat pumps are bad. And right, and so this, it's kind of this question of you know, as as public policy makers, you know, is is the government's job to uh, you know pick a technology, or is it to create a playing field under which we can compete? And at least in RNG coalition, we've taken the latter approach right. and said, you know, let's let the market decide. You know, if if transportation is the highest and best use, that's you know that is where the most benefits are going to come, and that's where the fuel is going to go. But if there's if there's a higher use case because a hospital in Boston needs reliability, dispatchability, and they want to get that from a renewable gas, well, RNG is their option, right? And so we, we need to not kind of paint with these broad brushes to say one is bad or the you know or the other has to be excluded. I think RNG should be an option. Very well. And just building from that somewhat, can you talk about the price of RNG, how it compares with diesel, with natural gas, and how big of an issue is price at this point in time? I well, let I me, just, let me just speak to it just, just generally. I mean, we're selling fuel now in transportation. We're selling uh, RNG at the same price as, as, as uh, a conventional natural gas and, and most often to a substantial discount to diesel. Which, you know, uh, I could argue, and I, I do with my salesman once in a while, I said, wow, we're selling the cleanest fuel. Remember, this 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 methane is 90% less NOx when it's burn, being burned into a in a Cummins engine that Marianne talked about. It's 90% less than diesel. And, and in some cases, four or five times less carbon. And we're selling it at a discount to the, diesiest, the dirtiest fuel uh, available in the world. <laughs> so something's not really right about all that, but, but, but you no, know, that's the way it's priced uh, today is our fleets get a uh, discount to, to diesel most often uh, substantial and we're pricing at a similar price to what fossil would be. Could I add also that the posted price at a CNG station is not necessarily the price that the, the fleets are paying. So there's even, even a lower price right. for, for that fuel. Yeah, you bet. There's more to this story, though, because I think you know what you guys have said is absolutely right, and that is that is where what the consumer is facing. But I think what the question's begging, you know, they want to look at kind of it. It costs more for us to get methane and clean methane up from a landfill than it does when you have economies of scale out out in you know the oil and gas fields. And so, you know, the question is kind of how do we get from you know a, a, a tough uh, you know, ex expensive product to be able to offer that to consumers. And I think the reality and where, you know, this industry is really done exceptionally well is we've worked to make sure that there uh, is a, a trustable and verifiable market for the environmental attributes with credits and certificates. And that's regulated and voluntary. And so, you know, I'm, I'm on the North American 
Energy Standards Board, right? And we, we built this model RNG contract for purchase and sale. And one of the most critical parts of that was making sure that we were defining the property law that goes with these environmental attributes so that you have something to be able to buy and sell on the secondary market, which allows you to deliver a product to consumers at or below CNG prices or natural gas prices if it's in the, the thermal side. All right, well, we'll finish on this question here. Several of you seem to agree that given its limited production potential, RNG should be focused on so-called hard to abate sectors. How can policy help make sure this happens? Here's what I would say to that is we're, we're in a phase right now where we should be building out as many RNG facilities as possible. There is fugitive methane coming from our society's waste that should be captured and kept out of the environment. And so from a policy standpoint, that's where we should be focused. Let's capture as much of this as possible. Let's make sure it's usable. Ultimately, once we've checked that box and tackled all of these facilities that are you know, available to be developed that aren't yet developed, and we're just scratching the surface here, then the market will start to direct that gas to the highest and best uses, right? So I don't think we need to project 20 years from now and say, Let's make sure that all uh, RNG goes to high industrial uses or to cement production or whatever you know we can dream up as the highest and best use. We need to build as much supply as possible, supply the market today, and then let the market sort that out long term. Well said. Well said, David. You know, I hate to jump in here because this has been such an illuminating discussion. You know, I want to thank all of you. I mean, the versatility of RNG, the issue of highest and best use, the fact that it's such a critical piece of this puzzle, and the fact that as you talked about, Andrew, it's here today. I mean, you know, I, I really want to thank all of you for, um, I think, providing an enormous um, window into where things are right now, what the potential is, and what the issues are that should be considered as we go forward. So, you know, to Marianne, to David, to Andrew, thank you very much for taking your time and for sharing your thoughts with our audience. Um, to David Manning, to our co-host, Brookhaven National Labs, thanks so much for moderating it today. Um, thanks to all of our partners, particularly Clean Energy Fuels, for your support of OEP. Uh, we couldn't be doing these things without your help, and without your support, um, and we uh, are very grateful. I do want to encourage everyone in the audience, uh, we We'll be back in September with a very full program, and we urge you to uh, join our various events. In the meantime, as you're working on issues, don't hesitate to use the Our Energy Library on the OEP website. It will have materials specific to today's discussion uh, at the top of the page, but of course, it covers all manner of things as the most comprehensive energy resource repository online. So please take advantage of it. Um, finally, I just want to wish all of you a great rest of the day, week, and remainder of the summer. Um, as David Manning sort of opened with, it's pretty hot out there in a lot of places. Try to stay cool, try to enjoy yourself, um, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. So thanks again to all of our panelists, our moderator, to our partners, and have a great rest of the week and rest of the summer. Thank you. Thank you, Bill.